Hello, and welcome to the Denim Think Tank discussion, Understanding Pakistan's Jazba for Denim. My name is Tricia Carey, and I'm Director of Global Business Development for Denim at Lensing. We transform trees into tensile, lyocell, and modal fibers, which are used by leading denim mills and brands around the world. To learn more about tensile denim, visit our Carved in Blue blog, or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. To see our amazing denim videos from our mill and brand partners, our Headspace series, and conversations like these, check out our YouTube channel, Blue Lens. As we attempt to make sense of what might be the future of our industry following the global pandemic, one positive aspect of this period of the lockdown is the willingness of the industry to come together to discuss and talk through the issues that face us all. There's been a realization during this crisis that denim mills are not just competitors, but colleagues, and uniquely in the case of Pakistan, even family. What is also remarkable is that while this panel of Pakistani denim mills, panelists are not just located in Pakistan, they are also in Italy and Turkey, representing the global expertise of the Pakistani mills has developed over the past several years. Textiles has been a part of Pakistan's economic backbone for decades. In the same way that Pakistan denim has been a major part of our industry's backbone over the same period. The Pakistan textile industry is a key exporter for the country, accounting for more than half of all overseas shipments. Despite this apparent success, in recent years, it has fallen behind the likes of Bangladesh and Vietnam, according to World Bank data. So we have gathered together today some of the key minds representing the Pakistan denim industry to understand how they are planning to tackle both local and global competition and learn how their jazba for denim. Jazba is actually the Hindu Urdu word for passion, which we felt really expressed uh, so much of the industry in Pakistan. Joining us in the discussion today is Ahmed Sheikh from Asgard 9, Aidan Tuzin from Navina Denim Mills, NDM, Ibru Dabag from Sorti, Hassan Javid from Artistic Global Industries, Max Del Lago from Artistic Fabric Mills, Rashid Iqbal from Navina Denim Limited, NDL, and Zaki Salim from Crescent. So we'll start the conversation uh, with questions for the panelists, and then we will open up to questions from the audience. And you can put your questions in the question box um, on your, your Zoom panel. I understand after some of the recent holidays that there have been an increase in COVID cases. Um, to date in Pakistan, there's been 200,000 cases confirmed and 4,000 deaths. Can you tell me a little bit of what's happening now in Pakistan and how, what capacity are you operating, any regional restrictions, and what you've been working on uh, in the meantime? And we'll kick this off with Rashid. Hi, Tricia. First of all, thank you so much for doing an entire panel on Pakistani jazba. And you have chosen the right word. We Pakistanis are very, very passionate, and that can be reflected in our denims. Uh, yes, uh, lately we have had some increased number of cases because of our Eid holidays and uh, we did not uh, practice the right uh, social distancing. Uh, but now the government has uh, started doing smart lockdowns and uh, I hear that since uh, three days the numbers have started going down. So we need to be more careful. Um, with respect to the industry, uh, last two months have been good compared to what happened in April. April was a total shutdown. And the moment European markets started opening, uh, our production was running on 40 to 50%. And I see July also almost uh, around 50%, which is fine compared to the uh, global scenario. So that is a positive thing that is happening in Pakistan and that's positive wave across the board. So I feel that is important. And going forward, I feel once the markets resume completely, Pakistan will be one country will, who will be able to get their share back. And why do I say this? The reason being, uh, 
when it comes to the supply chain, Pakistan being the fifth largest cotton growing country in the world, uh, with a fabric capacity of 500 million meters a year, uh, we are almost doing 118 million meter uh, units of garments. So we are very rightly placed and going forward, agility is going to be the name of the game. Um, if I'm to ship my fabrics to Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, let's say Bangladesh, it's three to four weeks transit time. And I don't see that buyers going forward will be uh, uh, waiting for three weeks. They would rather pay an extra 50, 70 cents to Pakistan and get the uh, fabrics. So therefore, I believe that uh, Pakistan will come out very strong once the markets resume. Great. Thank you, Rashid. And thanks for highlighting that agility. Zaki, mm -hmm. if you'd like to provide some input on what, what is happening now in Pakistan. Certainly. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, Tricia, for having us, uh, for having Crescent. Um, Rashid rightfully said, I, I think we, we're, uh, we're in a better position than we were earlier on. Though, you know, everybody takes precautions. Um, garment manufacturing itself is a very... Uh, uh, people intensive process. So you have a lot of interaction with people. There's a lot of reliance on digital. I see a lot of companies using it. We ourselves are using it. So a lot of the meetings where you could have like 12, 15 people in a meeting, there's a lot of Zoom component to it. There's a lot of social media. So everybody's taking precautions, which is a good thing. Hopefully the numbers uh, come down uh, soon. Um, they've already started a trend. Uh, with respect to the industry, um, we're probably, as Rashid has said, rightfully said, we're, we're, we're placed correctly. Um, specifics to denim and specifics to textile in a whole as well. Um, we are a lot more vertical than a lot of other countries where, you know, you have denim mills and then garment manufacturers, which are separate, and laundries, which are, you know, another set of businesses that are there, especially when you look at it, uh, with respect to Turkey. So I think vertical is key. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, focus on the unification of fabrics as well. So because we have, you know, there's a lot of stock uh, going forward, people want to simplify their inventories. When you talk about inventory simplification, you talk about reducing the number of qualities. So I, I think we're, we're in, a, in, in the right place. So let's, uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you. Ahmed? So, hello, Trisha, and thanks for having us here today. Um, after those two people, I'm not quite sure what to say, but um, uh, I think <clears throat> I don't really want to be repetitive. Uh, the, I think all of a sudden we're experiencing a surge of orders that was pent up demand uh, for garments, particularly from Europe as a current situation. I think that's partly because everyone was planning for the worst and then things worked out better than they'd expected. So there's a current demand, but in the longer run, I don't think we can expect the COVID pandemic to actually increase demand. So it will settle down at some reduced rate once people get what they need. I think Pakistan, as the others have said, is extremely well positioned due to its vertical supply chain. So we have cotton, yarn, fabrics, garments, all in one place. So I think we can move quickly. And I think that's one of the things today, what customers want, they want uh, goods very quick because they're, 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 they're nervous and they want to fill their shelves. What we've been doing, well, uh, of course, I think the real buzzword has been digitalization. I'm not talking only about Zoom calls. Of course, we're doing Zoom calls because um, everyone is you know, socially distancing and not meeting. But we're trying to digitalize our collections. We're offering digital collections, digital fashion shows, digital sampling, and we're developing all kinds of digital platforms. We have done some, and I think the pandemic has accelerated that, which in my opinion is far more sustainable because you don't send packages by DHL and burn plane fuel. So I think it's sustainable, it's faster, more economic, and I think it's a trend we're gonna see more of. Great, thank you. Hassan? Yeah, thank you, Trisha. Um, so technically, in the country, we're still under a smart lockdown where uh, shopping malls, restaurants, etc. are still closed. But uh, essential businesses and the export industries have uh, received permission to uh, run under very strict uh, SOPs. 
And we at AGI Denim started slow at the end of April when the first uh, phase of the lockdown was lifted. Initially, the main focus was to get everyone safely back to work. So there were very strict checks, regular trainings, uh, awareness sessions held um, in small groups at our facilities. And it took some time for everyone to get used to the social distancing rules and the new normal, as they say. Uh, now, in the last two months, we have gradually ramped up our production. And at the moment, we're running at close to 80%. And the goal for July is to uh, run at close to full strength, both on the garment side as well as on the denim fabric side. So we're fairly optimistic about the next couple of months at least. Great. Thank you. So when I first started covering the, the denim industry more for lensing, someone actually had to sit down and explain the whole landscape of, of the Pakistani denim mills. Um, and it really was quite confusing to me. Companies that have multiple names that are just slightly different. Um, and I really wish that someone would map out a family tree of all the families in Pakistan that are related to the denim industry. Uh, for NDL and NDM, can you explain the difference of your companies and, and how, uh, how this is all connected in the, the denim families in Pakistan? And we'll, we'll start with Aiden on this. Hi everyone, thank you Trisha for organizing this panel. And thank you also uh, for asking this question. This is indeed a frequently asked question we get often. And I'm glad that we can shed some light on this subject. And first of all, uh, let me start by saying that we are one big family. And as in every family, we are united in diversity. We have our differences that makes us stronger. We support each other when needed. We are also separate entities and we respect each other a lot. And uh, also to start with what makes us different, firstly, Navina Denim Mills, NDM is in Karachi, NDL is in Lahore. This means that we have two separate operations, production, product development, sales and marketing operations and teams are completely different. And uh, as Navina Denim Mills, Karachi unit, uh, we serve a wider portfolio. So it is a global presence. We have offices in the East Coast, West Coast in USA also in London, in Dhaka, and, in, and also in Istanbul. And uh, being the same group, uh, we believe we create synergy. First of all, there are several units we use in common. Spinning is a very important asset for whole group that we use together. We also have uh, joint investments in other operations as well. And um, secondly, since the customers we serve are usually different, we can offer a very wide range of uh, fabrics in our collections. We also have some protocols set in terms of customer portfolio. And uh, this is especially important in the USA market where both companies are very strong. And uh, to give an example, uh, Gap Inc. is served by Navina Denim Mills and Levi's is served by NDL. And last but not, not least, I want to say that family members value each other very much, regardless of their generational differences. This culture is also reflected in the way we work together with NDR. And uh, we may look separate and we are separate indeed, but we always support each other and uh, work in a harmony to, to create synergy. And Rashid has been working with the company for 20 years and counts as someone from the family. And I'm sure there are more important points that he may add to my words. Great, thank you. Rashid. I didn't thank you so much. Uh, although I've been working for 20 years, but I tell you what, you have summarized everything in two years. So <laughs> you've pretty much mentioned everything. But again, Patricia, thank you for giving us one more opportunity to explain our positions. Uh, like Aiden said, we are one single business entity with two separate units. Uh, with two, and the way I look at it is these are two separate development centers with different marketing teams, different product line, and serving different segments in the market. And within ourselves, we have very uh, uh, clearly defined boundaries. For instance, in the US, if Navina Lahore is working for Levi, Navina Karachi is working for Gap and we make sure that we don't cross over. So there is no confusion. Likewise, in Europe, there are certain customers which are common. And when that is the case, we always exchange notes. We talk to each other. And one point important that I feel, unlike the other companies with similar names, Navina 
group is not competing with each other. We're actually complementing each other. So that is important for us to understand that we have built up a synergy every now and then, you know, I give a call to Aiden, we exchange notes, we exchange ideas, and we make sure that, you know, unknowingly we are not ending up competing with each other. So that's the kind of synergy we have built within ourselves. So now our customers, most of the customers are very clear on our positions, what NDM and what uh, NDL is all about. So I hope I answers the question. Wonderful, thank you. That does clarify. And uh, I still think a family tree would be wonderful to see from I, Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> Great, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges around sustainability. Uh, the UN SDGs were set five years ago to provide guidance for all industries related to environmental and social well-being. What are the greatest challenges your company is working on towards the UN SDGs? And we'll start with Zaki on this. Um, well, to put it rightly, uh, Crescent uh, Bahuman Limited, I mean, the company that uh, uh, I represent, I'm working for currently, is uh, the oldest, one of the oldest vertical uh, denim facilities in Pakistan set up 25 years ago. So a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, points mentioned or the, uh, the SDGs that are there, we've been working towards a lot of those, uh, though perhaps we haven't been broadcasting them appropriately or packaging them appropriately. So, for example, we have this, uh, this literacy program where we have, uh, you know, taught people to read and write over 11,000 people uh, across our journey of 25 years. We have a school on facility, you know, so there, there is this whole ethos of education at Crescent. Um, coming back specifically to your question, I, th I think gender uh, is a hot topic for everybody. Getting that uh, into balance and into sync is a challenge. Um, us being in a remote location, 100 kilometers from Lahore, uh, we have to put in our work. So we're working towards that. Hopefully the target that we have found our company is 40%. Uh, uh, we, we intend to go to 50%, so it's, it's totally balanced. But right now the journey that we're on is 40% women, 60% men. And uh, the, so once again, repeating the, the first point, uh, from, from a Pakistani perspective, Packaging needs to come out there where we are able to tell people all the good things we've been doing. Obviously, there are 17 goals and we need to rate ourselves according to them, where we stand today and, uh, you know, where we intend to go in the short time span that, you know, certain uh, member countries have agreed to. Thank you. Yes, all 17 goals. It's a, it's a lot to tackle. Ibru, what are you working on at Sorty? Uh, thank you, Trisha, and thank you, everyone. And I actually think that we are currently fulfilling the SDG 17 partnership for, for, uh, for the goals uh, in this talk, where we get all together and try to share insight and ideas. So I would agree with Zaki that uh, Pakistan has a lot of the social progress already in place, and uh, this is also relevant to SORTI. So we've been using the SDGs as a guideline um, ever since they've been, they've been uh, announced, uh, but it's not easy to tackle all 17 of them all together. So we've been trying to kind of prioritize and prioritize where our impact makes more meaning. For instance, like climate change, Freshwater availability, marine life, circularity, social progress is where we decided that we should also work on more setting science-based targets. So SDGs are actually linked with data. They need to be linked with data. And this is not an easy task. And when we are such a complex uh, unit, uh, such a complex uh, operation, vertical operation with scattered units, gathering data, becomes a really, really difficult and complex uh, job. So that is what we have invested during the COVID period, uh, how we can get this data all together and, and assign science-based targets to all the SDGs uh, that we are trying to follow. Um, and also, 
uh, following SDGs and implementation of the SDGs is both a top to bottom and bottom to top kind of approach where we have to give a lot of training and a lot of education, not just to our own um, staff, our own workers, but also to customers and to citizens. So this is kind of like, I, I, I would like to go back to the SDG 17, where partnership becomes really valid and important. That's an essential part. And also design, because SDGs integrate design into the whole process as well as the product. So we have to kind of go back to the drawing board and see how we can really implement more of the SDG ideas into our collections. And again, I would like to say that uh, we have decided to really prioritize where our impact matters most. And this is very important for us. And we'll be sharing a lot of the data, again, uh, with our competition, with the industry, with our customers, as well as consumers, as we progress. Thank you. Thanks for that update. And yes, I think, you know, sustainability is the one aspect that we can all come around the table and agree um, and share that information for the common good. Aiden, can you give us an update on Navina? Yeah, thank you, Trisha. Okay, and in terms of environmental, economic, and social well-being, we believe that building positive transformation and is an effort of many hands and minds, not one player alone. This is uh, why our main focus is developing partnerships. In this regard, uh, we have been aligning our strategies with SDGs, and last year uh, we have signed the United Nations Global Compact to further reinforce our commitments to sustainability. With this signature, we commit ourselves to respecting human rights, providing a safe and decent working environment, protecting the environment, applying policies and practices that ensure transparent corporate management, and also providing our employees and society with sustainable values and benefits. Lately, uh, we have been focusing on SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, and to ensure availability and sustainable management of water, and we will soon sign the CEO water mandate. And uh, we consider social responsibility as a principal part and uh, one of the main pillars of our sustainability strategy. Currently, we focus on SDGs related to creating shared values for uh, the societies, such as gender equality, equality health and well-being, and also quality education. Uh, as Navina Group, we are very committed to women's empowerment. And although it's a quite challenging in Mills part compared to garment manufacturers, uh, we, we, we set in place on the job trainings and management trainee programs for women. And we are hoping to make a positive impact with this and change the gender landscape in the mill in the near future. This is one of the important goals uh, of the group. And in line with sustainable development uh, goal four, which is quality education, uh, we focus specifically on our social projects aimed to raising well-educated, healthy, and fruitful new generations. And uh, we have been running all expenses of more than 1,500 students in the different schools in cooperation with Citizen Foundation since 2014. And uh, we plan to expand uh, this network to include, include uh, 10,000 students in the near future. Wonderful. Really incredible uh, impact that you're having. Hassan, yeah. at Artistic Garment, what are some of your contributions towards the SDGs? Yeah, so we're actually working on several different ones, but I'll speak about three in particular. So it's funny that uh, Aiden mentioned about uh, TCF because we've also been partnering up with them for about the last 15 years, uh, promoting education in impoverished areas. And in the next phase, we're uh, going to roll this out to um, our staff members where their children can benefit from the schools that we sponsor. So they're actually doing some great work and I would uh, urge everyone to visit tcfusa.org if they would like to learn more. Uh, apart from this, for gender equality, we enrolled in the PACE program uh, with GAP Inc. back in 2016. And we're actually rolling out the next phase right now. We also started a digital healthcare platform for women. Um, our pilot project with a startup called Doctors 
won the Social Innovation Award from Tony Hilfiger. So that's something that was quite um, exciting. And then uh, for clean water and sanitation, in addition to the ETPs that we already have, we're adding on another uh, million gallons um, for an effluent treatment plant that will be installed later this year. And we'll be able to recycle about 75% of the water. Um, apart from this, we also planted 27,000 trees in partnership with the WWF back in 2017. Uh, one tree for every employee that we hire um, to sort of offset the carbon footprint. Wonderful. Great initiatives. And Ahmed, for you at Asgard? I think we're working on all of them, but we're focusing on some of them in particular. Um, so I think, first of all, the main objective of uh, having a business and, and trying to be sustainable is to reduce poverty and, and you know, reduce hunger. So in that case, I, as, you, as you said yourself, one of the first things that happens if you run a large industrial enterprise, you create lots of jobs, and that in itself starts helping the community. Moreover, in particular, what we do in addition to that, we run kids' schools, uh, we run loans for education, for paying for some of our staff to get more educated, and then when they get a better level of education, we pay better, similarly for their children. We have a training school for our workers, so where we pull in people and try and train them if they hit certain levels of output, we'll hire them. So that's the first thing, is that in a, in a country that's underdeveloped, our main and first goal is to reduce poverty. Uh, we're working on clean water. We provide with the community around. We partnered up with our local community. We provide clean drinking water stations. And when we had the lockdown, when we had the lockdown, uh, we also joined up with the community to distribute food uh, when people were hard up and so on. And um, uh, then finally, I'd like to talk about the energy side of things. I think Asgard is focused very much on renewable and clean energy. Today, our energy footprint, 65% is renewable, which I think is probably one of the best uh, in the industry, if not the best. And I, I think our goals are already there to increase that further over the next few years. Finally, I think uh, we're, we're here as a group of panelists, and I think what needs to be done is we need to create, for the sake of transparency, an index for these goals so that we can all benchmark ourselves and portray ourselves in a transparent and measurable manner. And that's something we're gonna work on and try and share with everyone. We can suggest some ideas and then work together for the future. Great, thank you. And, and touching on transparency, uh, there are a lot of discussions around where products are being made and who is making them. And sometimes uh, the transparency, we, we start to wonder how much is too much for transparency and does the consumer really care? Ebru, what are your thoughts around transparency in the industry? So I believe, we believe that B2B has a lot of responsibility to work around transparency and actually choosing the next partner or the partners in their supply chain so that that supply chain can actually convert into a value chain. And transparency has to kind of make sense. It just cannot be numbers. It needs to be an interactive storytelling communicated in a clear language based on facts to help consumers to make the real connection with the products and they are buying to the environmental and social values that the brand is supporting. So this is very, very important to understand. Transparency actually proposes full circularity and everyone has to be as strong uh, a partner in the whole circularity understanding of transparency to become the whole offer of the product or the brand. Uh, we have started uh, with our C2C line, uh, two years ago, public, public line, and C2C uh, requires actually full transparency. It's not just a product, it's the process and also a proposal of where the goods are made. And we found it to be very difficult to communicate the value added of the C2C products, even to our customers. And we went to the fabricant, we collaborated with the fabricant to digitize the whole content of C2C 
and that become more available. So that language was more available to both the consumers as well as to our customers. And then later on as the second stage, we could then integrate the full garment offer on C2C. Um, for instance, also Sorti is one of the biggest users of organic cotton from Pakistan and our use of organic cotton increased by 130% from 2018 to 2019. So that information is also an asset to our customers. You know, I mean, we have to go more into the detail of what we can really communicate to the consumers within the value chain. So our customers can benefit from what our infrastructure, what our investments are, how we're trying to approach this whole idea of transparency. I think, again, going back to the language and how we communicate transparency is essential, is very important. It cannot be talking about only numbers, you know, and you have only this tiny little tag where you have to put all this information, which again, needs to be relevant to the consumer. So we launched our future possibilities online and future possibilities is all about kind of transferring the transparency and the storytelling to the consumer, not just to our customers, but also to the consumer. I think we will see more and more of these initiatives. For instance, we need to also make uh, our customers as well as the consumers understand what certifications we are using and what those certifications can refer to. For instance, we have platinum lead certifi certified uh, factories. So that is not just one certification. It, it, it is for the people, it is for the process, it is for the buildings. And again, it's very important that we convey all this information, all this communication to the industry and share it with the consumers as well. Great, thank you. Yes, cradle to cradle, the C to C, uh, I think you've explain that very well and connecting it back to the transparency and circularity. Hassan, for you on uh, transparency, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, we feel that increased transparency is actually a good thing. Um, the final consumer is already aware of the fact that they need to buy less but better. And they now also care about how and where their clothes are made. So manufacturers now almost have no choice but to be more transparent. And we're finally seeing that the business interest is now aligned with doing good, which again, I think is a great thing. Uh, so, so we feel that in the future, opportunities will grow for brands and manufacturers doing the right thing. And Pakistan has unfortunately often suffered from a perception problem, but I think that there is great work now going on because of this increased scrutiny in general. So there's several different uh, lead certified units that have come up in the last few years. Um, suppliers have stepped up their compliance requirements and, and the efforts that they're putting in to meet the, those requirements. There's a lot more certifications um, and, and all this is leading to more premium brand sourcing from the country. Uh, the consumers, uh, you know, were finally starting to visit us before uh, this pandemic. And uh, a lot of them were often pleasantly surprised with what they saw on the ground here. And, and they felt that there was uh, a lot more that this country had to offer than even some of the regional competitors. So if the consumers hold brands responsible and they in turn ask for more accountability from their suppliers, I think it's uh, great for the entire ecosystem and everyone is uh, forced to improve because of this increased transparency. Thank you. So stores have been closed for three months in, in the West, uh, which are where most of your retailer brand customers are. Apparel sales are down 75% in, in most of the regions in the West. How do you think brands will need to recover? Should there just be one giant sale? Uh, Max, we haven't heard from you yet and wondering what your thoughts are on this and the recovery. Hi everybody and thank you Trisha to having me here. Uh, I think that first of all, we need to point up uh, uh, a little uh, on our customer because uh, we need to wish them the best to recover because without this customer, nobody's here to talk about the future of the denim. And uh, if possible, we need, we need also to spend some words because in the past I heard a lot of uh, critics about the customer that have a lot of uh, warehouse there, they leave a lot of uh, stocks there. Guys, this is the business. In the business, sometimes we win, sometimes we lost. And everybody needs to know the rule of the game. 
And then uh, the only things that we need to say is say, I hope that every single customer will recover and will be the stronger as before. And now, unfortunately, the situation is completely changed. Uh, whatever is lost, uh, is lost, uh, is a game. When the time of the game is over, win or lost, uh, is done. And then uh, uh, I don't think there will be a big sales against this loss. I think that the customer are managing the staff, are warehousing, are trying their best to have the minimum, the minimum impact on their loss profit. But at the end, sorry, the situation is critics. It means here in Europe, we are already open. In Italy, especially, is one of the countries that was opening first, but uh, the traffic is low. Talking with the people in the shops and talking with the customers, they are talking about 30% of the business compared to 2019. And this is tragic for all the chain, because uh, now, I'm sorry, the toys is broken. The chain is uh, not working as before. There was a stop for everybody. What I can say, uh, we hope that the, the business will recover soon. Unfortunately, you know, if uh, everybody in the media talk about the uh, return of the COVID in autumn, it means uh, it will be stuck the business for another six months. If this news is not true, we need to ask a billion dollar claims for who spread this news. Because if I have a shop and somebody come to me and say, in autumn, the COVID come back. I say, sorry, let's stop every single order that I have in my, I don't purchase anything more. And this uncertainty future will destroy the business. But the people outside are positive. Of course, after two, three months uh, lockdown, uh, there is less money in the pocket. Everybody having work, they have half salary, but even the, the, the online business probably have uh, I can say, have given enough uh, staff to the people. Now they don't need to go there anymore in the shops. There is traffic in the mall. There is a good traffic, but there is less people that shop. And if they shop, they shop cheap. They wait probably for the, the mega sale, but I don't think there will be a mega sale. The customer now need uh, money because uh, similar to a Bengali big company that produced 25 million pieces, even a big group as Next, Zara, or everything, they have 20, 30,000 employees. They have also to, they, they need to be responsible also for this kind of people. They have to pay the salary also there. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Max, for your input from Artistic Fabric Mills. Let's talk a little bit about fabric trends. Um, there's been a lot of talk around seasonless, uh, antiviral, antimicrobial, uh, low environmental impact. What are some of the fabric developments that you're working on? Uh, and we'll start with you, Ahmed. Okay. Um, well, I would say that the, there's what I call the macro trends. So the macro trends are increasing process improvements like using less water or recycling, reduce the energy consumption, the recycle the materials. So I think these are the, the macro trends. We're trying to incorporate these into our products in any case. Uh, if we go into the trends thereafter of what's, what's demanded or how do we think we can sell denim or grow its appeal in the world, I think at the, the current thing of being an antimicrobial or antibacterial is demanded because people want personal protection. They want to feel that when they're out there, they have something to protect them. And that's something I think we can apply across the board to just about every category of, of fabric that we um, produce. But for us today, where, where I see the new challenges is that while we apply all these um, you know, good practices, more sustainability, I think we need to push the boundaries of where we can introduce an indigo product. We've got our, our appeal for denim, but I think two areas. One is uh, active wear. So if we could have indigo active wear, I think it's not been done. That's something we're focusing on. And another thing is uh, like lounge wear. So, you know, make it more comfortable, make it like a crossover into knitwear and come in with that space so that people have an option of more indigo style product. So I think that's where we're focusing on in addition to all the norms, which is the high stretch with anti 
bacterial, antimicrobial, et cetera, obviously with all the recycling and um, uh, those sustainability measures being applied as well. That's how I see the future and the opportunity. Great, thank you. Yes, the, the consumer is definitely dressing differently for their lifestyle now. Uh, and so the comfort factor is, is key. Rashid, what are you doing at Navina from a fabric development side? Well, Tricia, um, that's a very good question. And I believe that innovation has to come from the mills. Therefore, it's our responsibility to understand the market demand, to understand what consumers are, are really looking for. You said no season. I think it's all seasons fabric. And therefore, what we have decided collectively is to come up with a, a collection called adaptive fabric collection. The idea behind it, this is where fashion meets performance. What we plan to do now is to add the performance elements in this collection. The fabrics would be with moisture management, thermal properties, adding uh, antimicrobacterial or antiviral um, uh, uh, coatings on that. We have, by the way, already uh, started working with a Swiss-based company called Alcoa, and uh, some of the trials have already been done, and uh, we're waiting for the lab test results. So hopefully, if we get a green signal, we'll be doing more developments on that on those protective wares. Biodegradable fibers is going to be important by using ripper bras and tensiles because that is important. And then the most important thing is the workwear, the strong denims, the durable denims. We have already been working on these strong uh, denims with Dyneema for the last two years. And we feel that this segment is going to grow and it's quite stable. So what we now plan to do is offer the workwear denim fabrics with one of these performance-based elements. Uh, talking about low impact, environmental impact, uh, we have ozone finishing machine and we plan to process all our fabrics or most of the fabrics with no water or less water. By using ozone gas, we are already reducing water by 70% to 80%. We plan to use more of recycled cotton as we all we have now our own shredder machine and we plan to use the industrial waste. And I think that is very important that, because that takes us towards zero wastage also in our industry. So that's important. And then there's a small uh, uh, discussion on organic dyes, but it's kind of too early to say that. Now, what we plan to do now, we want to be more flexible for our buyers and designers. So therefore what we have, we are now offering is a DIY, do it yourself. So basically once this collection is out there, Designers will now have the option to choose the color. And for instance, somebody wants to add a, a, want a soft hand and then tensile of course is there and add a moisture management or some kind of thermal properties. We are now flexible in offering that kind of tailor-made solutions. A customized development is what we are moving towards. And that's what I feel is important for the mills. So uh, these are some of the things that we're working on. I like the idea of customization and the, the DIY. Very good. Uh, Aiden, can you tell us uh, what you're doing at Navina? Yeah, I like also the do-it-yourself idea of Rashid and the flexibility is a must uh, today. So uh, in terms of uh, fabric trends, first of all, uh, I think it's important to redefine what trend, mean, trend means today. Uh, and in my op opinion, moving forward, and especially in the post-COVID world, it's very likely that we will not witness fast introduced or uh, fast consumed trends anymore. Uh, on the consumer side, there's a growing awareness about where things come from and how they are made. Less is really becoming uh, more today. I think seasonless, low impact, functional, comfortable, smart fabrics that meet the customer's increasing demand of well-being will be on the rise. And I, I think denim fabrics of today with new fibers, constructions, and treatment technologies meet demand, this demand perfectly. So designing for, for purpose is crucial and having a holistic strategic approach covering the entire supply chain will be even more important in the upcoming period. And uh, we are working on functional side. Uh, we work with different partners in the industry. We use different technologies and different blending uh, and uh, 
different technologies and fibers, blending them uh, to our already existing product lines, such as our smart stretch fabrics, which is RepTech, and also creating entirely new lines with them. We are currently working on a very demanded fabric line with antiviral properties, like uh, uh, Rashid mentioned also about that. The challenge here is longevity of this future. We are making different trials with different finishing and washing techniques to reach maximum laundry targets. It's a challenge. And sustainable fibers uh, is an area we focus more. We are working on more zero cotton fabrics using low impact fibers, such as tensile, refibra, modal, and also degradable fibers replacing elastan and polyester. And we constantly invest in innovation in terms of processes as well. For instance, uh, we are developing more colors and more fabrics with uh, our horizon concept, which is a unique mix of dyeing and finishing processes, reducing the effluent load while saving uh, water and energy. This is a summary Great. Uh, of what we are doing. You have a lot going on for sure. So Zaki, can you tell us what you're doing at Crescent? All of the above. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest challenges uh, to, to um, work on the right now is the fact that we have to inculcate sustainability into all aspects of our product manufacturing. So we're talking about green chemistry, we're talking about recycled post-industrial and post-consumer waste, and, and building that back into a product that is... Um, that's palatable, that buyers can actually uh, latch onto, that they can accept, and then your end consumer can accept. So, so our, our whole kitchen ingredients when it comes to denim is being recalculated on the basis whether it's sustainable or not. And fundamentally, that's, that's the journey that we have been on and that we continue on. Other than that, um, certain key areas that we're working on when it comes specifically to denim fabrics, you have to understand we are vertical. So, you know, in our end product, then it's, it's the finished garment that needs to be appealing to our customer. Unification of fabrics is key. Um, how do we eliminate all that waste in terms of number of qualities that have been there and that are now just, you know, building stock inventory. So I, I think a category, which is a very difficult tech category because uh, you have to basically evaluate and ascertain which qualities do you need to eliminate and where you need to build that center area. So that's, that's basically it. Um, additionally, uh, simplicity. So we're, we're looking similar to what Ahmed was saying. We, we need a lot more of the simple fabrics. Uh, that's, that's a category that we're looking on, uh, we're, we're actually currently working on. Um, a, a area which has been most talked about, and um, I, I know some of my colleagues here have, uh, have been promoting it at a number of, uh, of the trade shows. Hemp, hemp is, is important and it is in a certain percentage, uh, you know, uh, going to be there. Hopefully it does, uh, uh, become a staple. We're yet to see its adoption process. So if, if I sum it up, um, all the product categories that we're working on, especially when it comes to fabric, the key area of our focus is sustainability. Whether it's chemistry or the cotton raw material or the blending technology, that's where the focus area is. And obviously tensile um, comes into that as well. So even when we talk about the cottonized hemp, it's, it's mostly, you know, um, blending that we're talking about. So that's, that's our area of focus. And that's what we feel, you know, uh, our buyers are talking to us and we're working on that. Great. Thank you for the update. And Max, what are you working on at Artistic Fabric? Uh, well, what we are working for, sustainability first. Uh, we started... Uh, years ago with our shredding plant, a big shredding plant to produce uh, sustainable fabrics. We tried to push also the US side to introduce the, 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 the post-consumer waste in their fabrics with success at the end because finally after fighting for years, also GAP have 
agreed to use 5% of post-consumer. And from 5%, we reach now at zero virgin cotton. Then we cannot uh, only offer the typical 5% uh, or RCS 15% for the joint life or the 20% for the H&M or other customer. Our goal is to become more and more sustainable. Then our research is focused in minimize the ratio of the wastages, try to recover everything for our supply chain. We are enemy of the polyester because the polyester is a, a worse material, cannot be recovered yet and then we are pushing for skip the polyester from the production. Our main focus is sustainability. We start in 2013 with the first recycled polyester from the PET bottle. Now our goal after seven years is to skip the polyester, to use alternative fibers and get the maximum recovery from a simple fabrics. This is our mission and this is our business level, the business model that we have. Uh, use it for the development of the new article. Great, thank you. And when everyone talks about these different fabric innovations, spinning, um, what's needed for sustainability, what are then the investments that you need to make? What are your future investments and have you made any changes due to the pandemic? Um, and we'll start with Hassan on this. Yeah, so we're actually investing back in all three major areas of the business. So spinning, the denim fabric side, and the garment side as well. Um, and the idea in the past was always to invest in increasing the capacity. But now it's more about making smart investments in areas which are sometimes neglected. So water, energy, uh, chemicals, engineering. I'll start with the garment side. Um, we have had a strategic collaboration with Genealogia for a number of years now. Uh, we're one of the biggest consumers of uh, lasers in the region. And now we plan to invest more in uh, that technology later this year. Uh, we're also scaling up our water saving and recycling efforts, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, on the fabric side, we already made a decision to revamp our complete finishing line at the beginning of the year. So that's being done at the moment. And we're also going for more energy uh, saving machines. Apart from this, uh, we're also investing in renewable energy. So installing solar panels, uh, recycling certain chemicals like caustic, which is used on the dyeing and finishing side, and developing more fabrics with uh, zero waste water, both on the dyeing and the finishing side again. But the most exciting investment is on the spinning side. So early next year, we plan to have a brand new uh, state-of-the-art spinning mill equipped with the latest uh, European and Japanese technology. And uh, it's gonna be a fully automated plant designed on industry 4.0 principles. And the most interesting thing about this plant is that we're working closely with the machinery suppliers on a bespoke solution so that we have the maximum flexibility for running large percentages of recycled fibers and other eco-friendly raw materials, such as hemp, uh, reprieve, tensile, refibra, et cetera. Uh, we did pause for a few weeks during the crisis, but now it's back on track and uh, we are fully committed to this cause. Wonderful, thank you. Aiden for, for Navina. Yeah. And uh, in our case, we are uh, constantly investing in new projects and machinery to continuously upgrade ourselves with the most efficient and envir environmentally friendly technologies. We have recently launched an in-house innovation studio powered by Genealogia, uh, smart, which is Smart Lab. The, the, the lab includes a laser machine, ozone and e-flow by Genealogia. And this facility allows us to make developments on our fabrics with sustainable washes and provide the customers a full package solution. And although we are not, a, uh, we are not producing garments, we are a fabric mill only, we invest as if we do garments in order to provide an excellent service and full information to our customers. And uh, we have also invested in a new control system, which is SCADA. This is allowing us to measure our inputs and outflows of all our key indicate indicators like electricity and steam, water and natural gas in real time. So uh, we are able to share with our customers exactly how much energy or water or steam their specific, specific, specific fabric use. So we have uh, recently put in place a PCW recycling system. This is for is new uh, for the group, and uh, that can process up to five tons uh, of fiber per day. 
And we are also investing in a water recycling plant, recycling plant targeting recycling 90% uh, of water by 2023. And another field uh, we are investing is uh, in is digital. The fact that we cannot travel extensively to visit customers or we did, as we did before, and we cannot attend the trade show, we have been looking for new and creative ways of communication and uh, believing that the digital events will stay a part of our lives now we are investing more on our digital channels and currently working on a b2b uh, platform great look forward to hearing more about that rashid what are you doing at ndl well to him uh, most of us already been mentioned by uh, tricia uh, before we talk about denims i just would like to highlight the diverse portfolio of investments the group has uh, with uh, of course denim being one of them with a 36 million meters a year capacity the group has invested in wind power uh, of 50 megawatts we are into real estate and then recently we have added a steel re-rolling mill with a capacity of 200,000 tons a year having said this uh, we feel that you know we have the group is financially stable and i believe we will live through it even though uh, the textile sector is not performing the way it used to be. Now, coming back to my uh, responsibilities of denims, uh, my customers in last one year has been demanding for capacities, increasing capacities, and, uh, and I have been pushing my board of directors for quite some time, and I'm glad we did not add any capacity, otherwise I would have been in big trouble at, <laughs> right now. Uh, having said this, um, we, plan to invest in R&D. We plan to invest in sustainable dyeing and finishing machineries. And one of the um, uh, finishing range, the slasher dyeing, is what we have been studying with nitrogen chambers. Uh, that is one of the most sustainable way of uh, achieving darker shades. That's one of the things. And then again, like I said, um, uh, investing in R&D uh, fabric like hemp, we were the first ones to develop 100% hemp. And we still plan to continue investing in this direction with the uh, 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 hemp in uh, rope time. So these are some of the commitments that we have for the future. So Great, thank you. Ahmed, the investments from Asgard? Well, I'd like to start by saying that we have already achieved production in a large scale of yarns and fabrics with no virgin cotton of any kind. So that can be post-consumer waste mixed with pre-consumer waste, or it could be like a you know biodegradable fiber by by lensing mixed with the uh, post or pre-consumer waste. So we're already doing that, and we intend to continue that and try and promote more of that as one uh, investment with the product side of things. As far as the processes go, we're also looking to recycle water with a vision for having a zero liquid discharge or hazardous liquid discharge by 2023. Uh, we're also looking to expand our renewable energy footprint. Uh, I won't say 100%, but certainly 99% we believe is achievable in the next three to five years. And we'd like to do that as a part of our total sustainable manufacturing concepts. Uh, within the interface for the company, and as, as people have been touching on the idea that Due to the pandemic, the way we're going to conduct business is going to be somewhat different. People will travel less, people will touch and feel less, things will transform. Uh, we are working on our total digital digitalization, digital solutions. So we are looking to do digital collection developments where we give one set uh, of those tools to designers and our customers. They work with our designers. We make a digital collection before we produce it. We then put the samples on uh, by digital means where they can see them and try to come up with as much virtual solutions as we can, both for the product development, the product design, and actually trying to show them the samples and how they fit. The idea being, again, it's more sustainable, you know, we save fuel, we save money, we save time, and I think it's in everyone's interest. So that's where we're going to invest monies uh, other than the process and product itself. Great. Thank you. Ed Max, the investments of artistic fabric mills? Well, uh, 
the plan for the next five years uh, is number one to start uh, our new green uh, garment facility because our goal is to translate in garment all the success that we got in the fabrics. It means uh, if we have achieved 100% uh, free cotton from one article, we want to do what we, we want to understand what we can do in a green laundry means we want to be the first one to produce the most sustainable article in the world because we have the capability, we have invested a lot and now we think we have the knowledge to show our uh, know-how also in garment. In terms of fabrics, we are fine-tuning completely the whole process to adapt it to the new product thinking about the sustainability from the beginning, from the bale of uh, used garment that we are receiving. We are still working in minimize the wastages that we have from this uh, whooper of uh, used cotton, and then slowly, slowly understand what is the benefit that we can have in each department with modernization, technology, digitalization. Because every single step, both for technology and uh, sustainability and also to make the article cheap we need to save a resource in every single step and now we are focused on it at the end any case i think that the big big investment of all the pakistani company has to be in marketing themselves because uh, it's years as mr hassan has said that we are trying 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 to change the mood against the Pakistani industry due to the past uh, that was uh, the post uh, 9-11. Everybody don't think good about the Pakistan. This is the main marketing investment that the Pakistani industry has to do because uh, we really, I'm, I'm the, uh, the witness of it. I'm working there for 13 years. Nothing happens to me. I'm a very good guy. <laughs> But uh, you see around that the CSO made in Pakistan, sorry, don't. sorry guys, we need to work here. This is the main investment that we need to do in the next five years. Exactly, well said. And Ibru at Sorti, some of the future investments? Yes, um, we are targeting to be the most sustainable denim manufacturer we can be. So we're targeting to produce actually the impossible gene, which is integrated into the whole idea of the impossible burger. Uh, and we want to like go there. So post COVID is I think all about not just infrastructural investments, but more about how we engage with our communities, how we service our communities. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had launched our denim, uh, denim kind garment manufacturing facility, which reuses 85% of its water consumption, recycles 90% of the waste it produces, reduces its uh, energy consumption by 35% through solar panels. So that's kind of like the unit where we wanted to pro we want to produce the future of our uh, industry, future of our genes. So we have our uh, recently launched stitching thread factory and in our newer uh, gar fabric mill, we're using Smart Indigo. We've also been using Slusher um, on top of our Indigo rock dye systems to give more flexibility to the fabrics that we are producing. Um, during the COVID period, we launched our digital library and we've been actually introducing our collection through this digital library. So digitization is definitely one part of the investments that we are uh, going forward with. Um, and our customers have shown a very good response. We are uploading all our developments into the cloud and then making actually a digital library where we can customize uh, based on the consumers, uh, on the customer's needs a collection uh, to fulfill their needs. So farm to retail is one area that we are looking at uh, and investing in. Uh, I had mentioned that we have increased our organic cotton consumption by 130%. So we will take this idea and take it further to bring uh, to our customers an understanding of farm to retail through using regenerative fibers, 
organic cotton, again, redefining the process of those products, aim to be the most sustainable than a manufacturer we can be. And again, partnerships are very important. Genealogia, Tonello, we've been partnering with them to fulfill our process uh, responsibilities, uh, flexibility, efficiency, safety, uh, protective clothing is where we are investing further. So it's again, we're proposing seamless systems for the future of our industry. Uh, it's not just products, it's a whole system that we are uh, looking at that we will be offering so that that system can be put into use by the brands and be much easier for consumers to understand. Again, uh, definitely regenerative energy uh, is one area that we are looking at. All, all of this actually ties into innovation. So we're not looking to grow our volume. We're not looking into investing where the infrastructure where we can you know, uh, go, grow bigger with the volume, but it's more with IP uh, investment. It's more with how we can offer smarter products so we are going to launch our smart care uh, product um, container, which is coming out of our uh, R&D lab, uh, again, aiming uh, for the future of three. And we will be having further uh, partnerships with universities and centers uh, that we will be uh, launching in the coming weeks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the update. And we'll end this question with Zaki, uh, the future investments for Crescent. Thank you, Trisha. Um, having been uh, one of the uh, pioneers in the denim jeans business in Pakistan, Crescent has uh, played a formative role in over 100,000 careers in our industry. So um, we value people. Uh, there are three categories that we're investing in, and uh, the first being people. So there is, there is a lot of focus towards uh, collaboration, bringing in people from regional universities, having a two-way um, exchange where we, we treat innovation as a part of that exchange. So one of the universities closely located to Crescent Bahuman, that's, uh, that's participating in this. In addition to that, there, there is a lot of um, focus on uh, enhancement of training of individuals at Crescent. There is a lot of focus towards cross-departmental training uh, and building on some of the uh, talent that we have and bringing in new talent at the same time. So pe people is the category that Crescent has valued from its inception and it continues to do. So that's the, I think, main category Whenever, even if we look at how do you become agile, how do you become flexible, how do you become adaptive, it's, it's all about the people. Obviously, there is a machinery component to things that's not being neglected. So there is this whole aspect of automation where a lot of our dry process has transitioned over onto laser and the balance is going to be transitioned in the near future. Um, energy, uh, we intend to go green. 50% of our energy consumption will be green by the end of this year. And that will uh, uh, compensate towards the automation. So there are three categories. I'll, I'll just run them by you again. People, um, sustainability, which encompasses energy, water, and recycling, and automation. In recycling, we have, as others have as well, we, we are actually uh, using fiber. Uh, re basically, we, we are recycling the fiber in-house. So, so we have a shredding machine that we've acquired recently, and that gets us to the post-consumer waste portion. So three areas that we're investing on. Once again, people, sustainability, and automation. Great, thank you. I want to be mindful of our time, and we're on our last question. And I would there's been some wonderful um, uh, audience questions coming in too. So for the the future of the market, the denim industry, we know it's an eighty billion dollar industry, um, and statistics state that twenty percent of apparel produced is never even sold. We all agree that there's more weaving capacity uh, than demand for fabric and following the economics of supply and demand. 
what do you think will happen with the denim industry and at what level where will we see the consumer reset their consumption? Um, Max, what are your thoughts around where we're going in the future for the denim industry? If I have the magic ball, yeah. it was very, very helpful, but uh, I'm sure about one thing. Sir. Uh, this pandemic has shown what it means uh, overcapacity means the chain went broken and then a warehouse full of uh, uh, goods uh, people laid off uh, people fired and then uh, i can i can consider this situation as a lesson for the future because uh, if i'm looking to the to this pandemic as one example i can say that uh, only the strong be survive will survive why there is this overcapacity and you have a lot of uh, i'm the lonely not investor in the panel i think <laughs> uh, we need to ask them why they are increasing capacity a lot uh, i think uh, everybody want to produce more i start uh, to work in denim in the 90s in the 90s uh, the dream was a russian market my boss was saying if the business start we need another meals in 2000, the new uh, dream was the China. What is the next? In AFM, we think that the next miracle market will be the sustainability. In sustainability, we can have more space than before. But okay, we have a space when everybody, somebody out there will not have a space. If there is overcapacity, the load, the market is very cruel. Only the strong will survive. Only the strong or only the brave. We hear that only from the brave. Uh, <laughs> yes. Be the brave, yes. Be the first and be the brave. Uh, yes, yes. Ebru, uh, what are your comments on uh, the future of the industry and consumption levels? Well, um, we all know that the purchasing power of the co customers actually are diminished 40 to 50 percent. So the enemy industry will shrink before it can grow. That's based, that, that the whole understanding is based on volume. So we will see again um, an imbalance of uh, supply and demand uh, in the future, in the near future at least. And actually uh, the growth in our industry is all about understanding the needs of the customers, but it's in a more broader perspective than we are used to. Do. So we have to look at really what's happening, what the consumers are demanding, what their lives are uh, going to be, and then adapting our processes and products accordingly. Again, here, socially and environmentally integrated products and production, as well as transparency, is essential. So again, we're probably going back to the drawing board and looking at the SDGs again, and uh, looking at and seeing how integrated they are into the whole industry into our processes into into our products and how it's important to make the consumers and match to their uh, make the consumers understand as well as matching to their demands and i love the panel's name the jazba uh, of pakistan actually it's also a, a very relevant word in turkish we use it in jazibe in turkish as well so this is a new understanding of competition. I think we are rediscovering our industry, how we are in the relationship with each other. I mean, the panels you are running, the people getting on those panels, sharing their ideas, sharing the ideas for their future product development, investment plans. This is huge. This, you know, we need to take this very seriously. This is a huge, huge, um, I think, progress. Um, and again, I'm seeing more of the industry collaborators looking at both processes and products which are good for the people as well as good for the planet. The collection which we had launched previously was called the Climate Collection. And uh, during the COVID period, the collection we were launching was going to be more geared towards understanding the Gen Z. But then we said, it's not all it's not just about gen z it's about our humanity so we called it the human collection and we will pursue 
our um, exploration into collaboration and into the demands of our humanity and how we can really bring those in equilibrium. So we need to be in sync and in harmony with what's happening globally. And then I think that is where the whole industry will start to take off again. So, well, well said. Yes, you I, the I think opportunity to express this. Thank you. Yes, yes. I, mean, I, I think we've all realized through this time how interconnected we are. Um, so I want to just go through a couple of the questions that we've received from uh, attendees. Uh, and one here is, with the acute shortage of water in Karachi, humans are unable to get the clean water that they need. Um, and what's the point to run denim mills in this city if they're using water, even though they're using some newer technologies that uh, reduce the water levels, it's still use of billions of liters of water. Um, do they really care for sustainability? And what about humanity? And so I would like to see if one of the mills um, from Karachi would like to answer this. I don't know if Aiden, uh, if you would like to answer this question. Yeah, uh, it's a really tough question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly, it seems like a dilemma, uh, but considering the uh, labor force that the mills are creating, the, that the manufacturing, that the textile industry is creating uh, is very important. And uh, like us, everybody in the textile industry in Pakistan are working more on sustainability goals, which the most important one is water, clean water and less water, and also developing fabrics, processes that use less water or even no water. We are all working uh, on these uh, sustainability goals. And I think this is a, a solution uh, for the near future to this problem in the city. Yes, I think it is always a challenge because as we were you know, commenting before we got online is the humanity part of providing jobs and education and all the other social services that I hear that many of the companies in Pakistan are providing. And yet, you know, here's the trade-off and here's the dilemma with the amount of water that's needed. So I think it, you know, it comes down to the responsibility that the companies can take. Um, another question that we have is, uh, what are, is the position of sustainability re regarding elastic yarns? Um, who would like to address this? Because I, I also see this as a, you know, as an issue within the denim industry around um, el elastic yarns. Hassan, is this a, a topic you would like to discuss on what you might be doing around um, elastic yarns and sustainability? Sure. So we're already using um, Royka and uh, the Lycra company's new recycled uh, Lycra that they've introduced. So we're using that, and uh, in the future, uh, you know, the plan is that we need to come up with a solution whereby those garments with higher percentages of uh, stretch in them can also be successfully recycled. I think that's one of the challenges that we face at the moment. So we definitely need to come up with a, a smart way to to work around that for the future. Thank you. Let me jump in, Trisha, please, to please do. Repeat, yeah. to repeat to what I said before. The problem is not uh, the 2% of uh, elastomeric material that we put inside. Of course, uh, there is uh, the biodegradable Lycra XYZ, but we are talking about 2%. The main problem of recovering a used garment is the polyester. All the cheaper garment, all the um, super stretch for lady, the, the normal jeggings, is 67% cotton in warp and 27% polyester in weft because it's cheap, because it's given new performance. And the problem is really, uh, after that is double. We cannot split the cotton from poly. We need a very huge investment to do that. Uh, and I don't think the market is ready to afford this kind of investment in this moment. But this is the reality. The problem of the stretch is not the Lycra. Recover 2%. Is not even a problem in money, but recover 27%, yes, is a big challenge. And then the main goal for the sustainability 
to create a better world is to skip the petrol based material from the denim. The denim board as a cotton product. We can achieve a super performance blending with tensile, blending with other fiber, but that is a cellulosic fiber and can be recovered thousand and thousand and thousand times. And when we are talking about a petrol based product, I'm sorry, and this one is a disaster for every single uh, recycled material. This is the main problem of the stretch. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here with all the investments in sustainability. Um, who's going to pay for this? Uh, how do you manage this within your business? Because ultimately the cost of products, uh, how, how is that impacted? And I'm wondering, Ahmed, if you could answer this from Asgard 9's perspective? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, the question, in my, in my opinion, doesn't really understand uh, the impact of sustainability. In a, when we apply sustainability, I believe that we are not impacting the cost, but we're actually reducing the cost. So if we save water, if we save chemicals, if we recycle the material, if we use uh, renewable energies, then the cost on an operation basis is actually reduced. So yes, there is a whole, a huge investment initially to start start up these processes, buy the required equipment, train the people and get into all of that. But going forward, once we depreciate the capital expenditures, the operational cost of such products is actually reduced. And I think that's a very important point to understand. Uh, so, um, and, and you know, that all ties in that, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to make a partnership first and foremost with all the people that work with the company, around the company, suppliers, um, you know, employees uh, and customers. So the more interactive we are, we always find ways to actually make more efficiency between us and find cost-effective solutions going forward. That's what I would observe. Great, thank you. Um, we have some more wonderful questions and we'll try to get to those separately through email, but we've, we've gone um, over time and I knew we would because we have such an intriguing panel and it's not often that we can get everyone together. Um, but I would like to close with uh, if everyone could say one word of their hope for the denim industry and where they see it at. And we'll start with you, Ahmed. Just one word, right? One word. This is the challenge. Symbiotic. Okay, very good. Aiden? <laughs> I guess it will not be surprising for you, generosity. I <laughs> love it. That's, um, that's like two words combined though, so. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Ebru? Regenerative. Wonderful. Hassan? Crossroads. I think the industry is at a very interesting crossroads right now. Great. Max? I'm with Ebro. Regeneration is the, 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 the great word. Perfect. Rashid? I think we need to stay strong and compose. Great. Zaki? It's the journey. Yes, it is. So with that, I want to give everyone a thanks for sharing their time, their thoughts, their expertise, and most of all, your jazz buff for denim. Uh, I hope that's a word that we'll integrate more into our conversations. And I actually have to say that we brought that into this conversation. Uh, it was Michael Kinnamon who, who said we need to uh, include that in here. So our, our in-house wordsmith, Michael. Um, up next week, uh, Michael Kinamanth is also hosting a webinar on July 7th with the title of Freelancing is Not a Free Ride. Um, I think, you know, the denim industry is also built on a lot of creativity of talent um, through our freelance uh, specialists. If you'd like to be involved in future conversations, just email me. We welcome a variety of different people and of different um, ideas into what we've been highlighting in our denim think tanks, because we realize that now is the time for this change and progress that we need in our industry. To find out more about Carved in Blue, uh, you can find us on our blog. And I also want to give a shout out to Mosin and Saudia who help us with their graphic expertise, as well as their hosting of these talks that we have. So thank you very much. And I'm going to sign off with my mini denim jean here. 
um, which is uh, made from, from cone denim uh, with Tencel. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.